we shall never forget. It is perhaps the greatest escape story in history, having baffled even the world's best scientists. A novel coronavirus continues to evade eradication and control, despite various means employed to flatten its deadly curve that has reached practically every corner of the globe to achieve the status of a pandemic pathogen, apparently even able to evade vaccines. Dr. Anthony S. Fauci, reportedly the nation's leading infectious disease control expert and the director at NIAID, has insisted upon the theory that it was not the product of a virology laboratory, but simply an occurrence of nature and random chance. It has been alleged that from some still yet unknown animal source that presented a reservoir of the largest class of viruses and largest in mass from amongst the most abundant biological particles in the world found its way to a wholesale seafood market to infect just 27 vendors, many families, that set off a chain of events that has resulted in the infections of over 34 million American citizens and the deaths of over 615,000, leading the world, 93% of whom are over the age of 60, over 78% of whom are over the age of 65, and 13.3% of whom, the largest aggregate, were found to be of the bracket of age 85 or older, and most of whom resided in nursing homes, a known fatality risk population from the earliest days of a global health crisis. Yet despite drastic lockdowns that canceled all visitations, a novel coronavirus, a single strand of ribonucleic acid, a genome measured in nanoparticle units, was able to successfully evade the tightest security measures even at veterans care facilities, leaving behind a wake of destruction that has been credited with the deaths of almost 13,000 veterans left to die in isolation upon fears of spreading what has been identified as a highly contagious disease. It is an intriguing tale about a novel coronavirus that had somehow escaped draconian lockdowns in a totalitarian regime, that had within just nine months announced a total victory over COVID-19 as the leader of the People's Republic of China before the splendid background of the Great Hall had celebrated its decisive leadership without even one pharmacological measure. But according to the most recent reports, the pandemic pathogen has even returned there. It had evaded the lockdowns in China and had begun its path of destruction, avoiding the top 16 domestic and international destinations from Wuhan airport to migrate en masse to the Republic of South Korea, the most avowed enemy of the People's Republic, while sparing the Republic of North Korea, the closest and strongest ally of the Beijing regime. It had skipped over Hawaii, the closest American state in the Pacific to Asia, during the celebration of the Chinese New Year of the Rat, but had also avoided the top three American cities with Chinese populations in New York, Los Angeles, and San Francisco, arriving first on the West Coast in the city of Seattle, where the first reported case of infection had managed to avoid infecting as many as 68 close tracer contacts, yet found his unique virus infecting at least 39 others throughout the entire state and with whom he had no direct contact while on the east, arriving in the city of Boston. But for the next few moments, we shall examine another escape artist with a notorious reputation that had evaded the best minds and even escaped lockdowns that no one else could escape until he found himself in a final solution. We shall never forget. Many may recall the tales of a old dark 30 suitable for a blockbuster film. Even after months of planning on the moonless night of May 2nd, 2011, a host of at least five helicopters, special ops, and 23 Navy SEALs in a daring raid were able to capture Osama bin Laden, the mastermind planner of the 9-11 terrorist attacks who had successfully evaded the best of the world's intelligence organizations for almost a decade. But on May 11th, 1960, Jack Kennedy was just a presidential candidate. And on that day, Rafi 
Eitan, an officer in the Mossad, the elite special operations and intelligence unit for the Israeli Defense Force, or IDF, led an extraction team to infiltrate into Argentina after Israeli intelligence analysis had, had developed a lead regarding a Nazi war criminal who had managed to escape for 15 years, four more than Osama bin Laden. Adolf Eichmann, a former salesman in his father's business, who was ambitious and had sought advancement through politics, where he was assigned to logistics, but would be placed on trial from April 11th to December 15th, 1961. Rafi Atian, the man who had captured Adolf Eichmann, who had been assigned to the head office for Reich Security, or RSHA, which fell under the SS, which was under the direction of Reinhard Heydrich, who had been handpicked by Reichsfuhrer Heinrich Himmler, and into which the state secret police, or Gestapo, was later merged, would become the authorized referent of the RSHA, and matters connected with the final solution of the Jewish question, a pestilence that had for years abated even the world's best scientists in Germany, until they found a method to quarantine and isolate the problem to prevent its spread. We shall never forget. In the resettlement camps, it was a policy that the cripples and the sick from the camp were non-essential and must as quickly as possible be liquidated in order to alleviate the burden carried by the camp. And long before gas and Zyklon B were ever used against the Jews, the officers in internal security had determined that it was the most efficient manner in which to eliminate the mentally ill. They simply had no purpose and contributed no value added to the motherland and the architects of the Reich and were only a burden which could quite readily and with great facility be exterminated by the state that the common good might accrue a benefit of the elimination of a population that would scarcely be missed. Intriguingly, in the relocation camps, the Poles were still yet granted a preferential treatment and only in the rarest of rare circumstances were executed but rather were permitted to expire from shall we say natural causes albeit with the restrictions of work camps where the options for a quite natural death presented an infinite range of shall we say infinite possibilities and when confronted with formidable forces, the range of options are generally restricted to one of only two choices, to fight or seek flight. But desperation is the gateway to despair. And when isolated from family, friends, and even your God, it is inevitable that at some determinate point, the victim shall accept the conclusion that resistance is futile and contribute to his own demise. Patience and time, it's a lost cause and not even your God shall save you forever. And Adolf Eichmann knew well that time was on his side, at least until May 11th, 1961, when the hunter finally became the hunted. We shall never forget. And during his trial in Israel, the court determined that the excuse given by the accused in his evidence that all he did was to pass on a message which he received from Krakow is not plausible because undoubtedly he knew the value of the tale about administration of tonics to which he put his signature. He shall never forget. Adolf Eichmann was not the most capable student in high school or college and even upon graduation found himself working as a salesman in his father's business. Yet somehow, as Allied forces converged upon Berlin. After a sweeping invasion at Normandy, Adolf Eichmann somehow managed to evade capture, escape the entire continent of Europe, and secretly enter the nation of Argentina that had prohibited extradition. In all respects, he must have been proud for a successful execution of a perfect plan, entering Argentina under assumed alias and in disguise on an entirely different continent and far out of the way of history. But as explained by the court on April 11, 1962, one year after his apprehension by trained special operations soldiers led by Rafi Atin, an officer in Mossad, the elite special operations and intelligence unit for the IDF, it was his incredible cleverness that would lead 
eventually to his undoing. Adolf Eichmann made at least one fatal mistake upon fleeing capture in Germany to a country that prohibited extradition and had even the past, even in the past, upheld that promise of protection in honor of that extra-legal agreement. He shall never forget. That court found, it is to be pointed out here, that even the jurists of the Third Reich did not dare to put on paper that obedience to orders is above all. They did not repeal Section 47.2 of the German Military Criminal Code, which states that whoever commits an offense against the criminal law through obedience to a superior's order is punishable as an accomplice to a criminal act if he knew that the order concerned an act which is a crime or an offense according to the general military law. This provision was applicable also to SS men according to the laws of the jurisdiction over them. We shall never forget. That court found that of course the accused well knew that the order for the physical extermination of the Jews was manifestly illegal and that by carrying out this order he was committing criminal acts on an enormous scale and concluded that to arrive at this finding we do not have to rely on the accused because according to section 19b the question as to whether an order is manifestly illegal is a question of law left to be decided by the court according to objective criteria we shall never forget one of adolf eichmann's most critical errors was that he failed to recognize when even a big lie had run its course and did not recognize when it was time to tell the truth adolf eichmann had thought that he was clever but the court was convinced that the accused gave false testimony when he stated that he had sent the first transports from the right territory to the Lodz ghetto in October 1941 in order to rescue the Jews from death at the hands of operation units. We shall never forget. The court stated that the fact that one of the aforesaid agents, precisely the one who was accused of having conceived and directed the cold-blooded execution of a vast plan of extermination should have entered and settled in Argentine territory under a false name and false documents in obviously irregular circumstances, in no way covered by the conditions for territorial asylum or refuge does not justify the gratuitous assertion that many Nazis live in Argentina. The question as to whether or not other Nazis reside in Argentina has no relevance to this case. And if we cite from the above mentioned note, it is only to show that the position taken by the government of Argentina is that Argentina has not given an asylum or refuge to the accused who entered her territory and settled therein under false name and a false document in obviously irregular circumstances which do not in any way tally with the conditions for territorial asylum or refuge. We shall never forget. And during his trial in Israel, the court determined that the excuse given by the accused in his evidence that all he did was to pass on a message which he received from Krakow is not plausible because undoubtedly he knew the value of the tale about administration of tonics to which he put his signature. We shall never forget. That court found that truth is that at the time of the negotiations regarding these transports to Lodz in the second part of September 1941, the accused knew full well that the Jews in the Lodz ghetto would be exterminated sooner or later because such was the Fuhrer's command. We shall never forget. The court found that the facts which have been demonstrated showed not only that the accused knew of the intent to destroy the Jewish people, which lay within the plan for the final solution, but he personally was also permeated with this intent. We shall never forget. And ultimately the man who had assumed that he had escaped culpability, the man who had assumed a false identity upon entering Argentina, the man who had assumed a false face, had also in error assumed that just because the nation had an extradition agreement, 
he would be shielded from punishment for his heinous crimes. But during his trial, that court determined that a non-extradition agreement is a prerogative of a sovereign nation. And if they do not protest your capture, you should have read the fine print of the agreement and taken the time to have a good, honest talk with your protector. This briefing is unclassified. He shall never forget. He shall never forget. Please feel free to hang as long as you want. A little going away party. It would be so nice for you to join us. Mr. Eichmann, you put up quite the fight. I was very impressed. And it was so nice of you to give the names of your many Nazi friends in Argentina. But you must understand international politics. We have a special deal going today. We are only prosecuting those who have killed six million Jews in prosecutorial discretion. If you happen to know someone else who killed six million Jews, we might be interested and might be able to arrange a deal. However, for now, we're preparing a nice symbol for you. And Mr. Eichmann, you will never forget. Here, tough guy, not so tough anymore. This advertisement was authorized by Mike Webb. Please feel free to hang as long as you want. <laughs>